Last week, we talked about identifying your giant. And I want to thank those of you who took the time to spend time praying about it and thinking about it and laying it before the Lord. Uh, I got some emails from different people identifying their giants and saying, yeah, I can see this in my life. This is a problem. This is not a good thing in my life. And so today, now that we've identified it, we need to prepare for it. You've got to prepare to fight. You do not get to slay something without preparation. Uh, let, me, let me tell you a story about preparation for my life. You guys are going to like this. <laughs> I, uh, I don't like it, but you're going to like it. When um, I was in my first house, we've had a number of houses now, but in my very first house, uh, do you know when you decide you're going to take on projects, but maybe it's a little bit too big for you, but you don't want to admit it? No? Nobody here? That's all right. I'm like that. I love taking projects on. I love fixing things myself. I uh, have this um, insane concept, and I think as I've gotten older, I've gotten better and better about realizing how bad I am at it. Uh, but I, I love to think I can take on projects and do them as well as a Richard or a Jeff or somebody who's like a perfectionist. But what I've learned about myself is I'm not a perfectionist, and I'm really good at the demo work. I'm just not great at the finished part of it. And uh, so we had this bathroom, and uh, there was no window in it. Uh, so it was just a bathroom. It had a fan and a light in the ceiling. And um, I shouldn't even tell you this because you're going to judge me forever. But uh, that light, it went out. It stopped working. The fan stopped working. You flip the switch, nothing would happen. So I was like, oh, all right, I'm going to fix this. So what's the first thing you do? You go and you check the breakers. I check the breakers. They're all fine. All right, what's the next thing you do? Well, let me make sure the bulbs are fine. Let me make sure nothing's shorted out in the light. So I start taking things apart. And I pull the light down, and I'm looking at the fan, and that looks fine, and everything looks fine, and I'm like, all right, great, now I have to go to Home Depot, and i got to buy a new vent, and i got to buy a new light, and i got to do all this stuff, so I started doing that. I went to take the <laughs> vent out of the ceiling, but I didn't have the right tools. You ever happen to you? You ever approach a project and not have the right tools? Even one time? <laughs> it's a real blast, isn't it? I didn't have the right tools, but I didn't care, because I was young, and I was dumber than I am now. So I took my circular saw and I just held the guard back. <laughs> and, I just, <laughs> and, I, and I cut a square around the vent. And I started pulling and I couldn't get it down. They had screwed it into the uh, sides. And I just, I spent like probably seven hours ripping the vent out. Then I got the new one. And don't laugh at me, Richard, all right? <laughs> I'm going to call you this week. Nick, fun of you. I'm sure you have good stories too. I, I spent seven hours. Uh, ripping this vent out of this bathroom. The bathroom was small. It wasn't a big bathroom. It was the only bathroom in the house. There was no light inside. So we had run a, a lamp with an extension cord in there just so we could see at night if we had to use the bathroom. Um, I ripped the vent out of the ceiling. I spent the seven hours getting it out. My friend's there. He's just heckling me the entire time. It was great. Uh, I finally get the uh, new vent hooked up. I have it all set up the way it's supposed to be. I go over to the light switch. I hit the switch. Oh, yeah. It's like, you have got to be kidding me. I had to use a circular saw to get this thing out of here. There's no, how is this not? I hit it again, back and forth, back and forth. It's the funniest thing. You can hit it more than once, it doesn't do anything. I start to try to figure out what's wrong with it. And I'm looking around and I see, because it's a bathroom, we have those GFCI outlets. GFI. Yeah, that one. Sure. I know there's some letters there. The ones that stop you from dying if electricity hits water. How about that? And I look, I lean over. Oh, no. Now, that, to be fair, there's like a flower in front of me. <laughs> and I push the button, and it flips right on. And I turn it off and turn it on and turn it off and turn it on. It works great. Which means that the old one would work great too if I just hit the button. But what I failed to do in that moment was prepare. Preparation in life is so important. Being prepared to face battles that you may not even imagine you will face is so important. And do you know that there are things in your life that happen now? Uh, they could happen tomorrow. They might have happened in the past. And you never, ever would associate them with preparation until God brings you to a new place. Until he says... All right, now I'm going to release you to do this. And when you go to do it, you're going to do it with a great attitude. Things like, I don't know, cutting holes in ceilings. 
taking the time to think about things before you do them. <laughs> taking the time to sit down and count the cost. Jesus talks about that, doesn't he? He says, count the wise man counts the cost before he builds a house on the other guy who just buys a bunch of four by fours and hopes he can wing it. I already said it to Vicky about the playground. She's like, no, no. We're going to get set. <laughs> it's like, right. So we could probably make a nicer one. She's like, mm -mm. <laughs> she knows. The Old Testament is full of stories where people are used in something that like they've been used in in the past. I was talking to Missy about it this week, and you can flip there if you want, but you don't have to. In Judges, there's a story about a man named Ehud. It's my favorite story in Judges. And God, there's this awful uh, slavery going on. There's horrible things happening. God raises Ehud up. He makes a dagger. And it's significant because he's left-handed. He's from the tribe of Benjamin. Nobody was left-handed back then. That's why it's so significant. At least, if you were left-handed, you weren't allowed to use your left hand. You weren't trained to fight left-handed. Nobody did, but Ehud did. So this hand, this left hand that he's been spending his entire life preparing for and using in different ways, using the different things God uses to deliver the land. It's a great story. He makes a dagger, he stabs a guy, and the guy is so fat the dagger gets stuck in his stomach and he can't get it out, and he just leaves it. It's true. It's in the Bible. Judges chapter 3. Great story. You go to Judges chapter 4, there's another lady. Her name's J.L. I was talking to Missy about this one too. And she's going, uh, there are this transient group who are going and setting up tents and breaking them down, and setting up tents and breaking them down. And the commander of the enemy army comes, and he says, oh, I'm so thirsty. And he goes into this woman's tent, he says, give me some milk. So she warms it up, and she gives it to him, and he falls asleep. And you know what she does? She does the same thing she's been doing over and over and over again. She just does it into a guy instead of the ground. And she tells him of the tent pit. And it liberates all these people. It frees all these captives. God uses her. Now, you're probably not going to be asked to assassinate someone, I hope. If you are, come talk to me. We'll have a conversation about it. Uh, and you're probably not going to be asked to kill someone with a tent peg, but you might be asked to minister in a way that God uses you right now that you're not paying attention to. Someone like Donna, who has amazing gifts of hospitality, has been used to minister to firemen and police officers and teachers and on and on and on. And that's a ministry. To be able to go and bake and do these things. She was talking to me. She visited with us this week while I was trying not to go insane with my kids here. And uh, she was telling me all about her years and years as a missionettes director. Years and years of just directing missionettes and pouring into the lives of these children. That time's not wasted. That's a gift from God. It prepares her for the next step in her journey. This thing Missy's going through now with her job is preparing her for the next step in what God has for her. And I'll tell you this, if you're without employment and you need to talk to someone, you know who's a good person to talk to? Someone who's gone through it. Isn't it amazing that God raises people up amongst us who go through very difficult, hard things? They're awful, awful, unspeakable things at times, just so that we can minister to one another. Sue lost her husband. I bet she has a pretty good perspective on grieving and hurt. Pastor Peter lost his son. I wouldn't want to talk to anybody else if something ever happened to my kids. God has let people go through things that are unspeakable in preparation for battles they didn't even know they would have to fight. And he's using them day by day by day. Go with me now. We're going to go to 1 Samuel 17 again. We're going to tap back into David. And I just want you, for a brief moment, to pay attention to the temptations he faces as he prepares to fight a giant. 1 Samuel chapter 17. We're going to start in verse 34. Just to remind you. Last week we talked about identifying giants. When David goes and talks to Saul about the giants, this is what he says. Your servant used to keep his father's sheep. And when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went out after it and struck it and delivered this lamb from its mouth. And when it arose against me, I caught it by its beard and struck and killed it. Your servant has killed both lion and bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing he has defiled the armies of the living God. Moreover, David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. 
Saul expresses concern when David arrives. He sees him and he says, you're a boy. You're just a boy. How are you going to fight this guy? He's been fighting since he was little. He's been training his whole life. He's been preparing for this moment. He's been preparing and preparing and preparing. He thinks he knows everything. How are you, a boy, going to fight this? And David starts to list off all the different ways God prepared him. What does he say? I fought lions. I fought bears. These little things, these little sheep that probably would have been insignificant. Just be honest for a second, right? There's some big guys here. There's some strong women in this room. If you were watching a group of sheep and a lion came out of the forest and grabbed one in its mouth, just a show of hands, just be honest. I can't see you Zoom folks, but I'll just assume you're raising your hands. How many of you would go, oh man, that's too bad for that sheep? <laughs> just be honest. You're, how many of you would go, okay, I'll just head right into those woods. I'm going to stab that lion and I'm going to get that sheep back. I, I don't know about you. I know myself though, and I do not have the courage to do that. Well, yeah, that's true. If it was, <laughs> no, let me just say if it was her dog, she would do it. That's probably true. But sheep, eh. <laughs> like, we have like, you know, a hundred more. There's a whole group of them. But God was preparing David. He was filling him and showing him how to be brave when there were predators around. He was showing that he was responsible when things were difficult. He was pursuing that which didn't even have that much value, maybe, to other people, but to him was priceless. He refused to let the sheep die. And God uses this as the evidence in David's life of a faithful man. Someone who's really pursuing men after God's heart. So Saul says to him, go and the Lord be with you. And in that moment, Saul does something that's significant. He surrenders his kingship. He surrenders his authority. He surrenders his role as the leader of a nation. And he says, go and the Lord be with you. This battle that I'm supposed to be fighting, you fight, little boy. Go right ahead. Listen to what happens. My eyes are bad. We're in verse 38 now. So Saul clothed David with his armor, and he put a bronze helmet on his head. He also clothed him with a coat of mail. David fastened his sword to his armor and tried to walk, for he had not tested them. And David said to Saul, Cannot walk with these, for I have not tested them. So David took them off. Back in those days, armor was the most important thing a soldier had. I was reading into this this week is really interesting. Armor was the most important thing a soldier had because armor had to be fitted to the soldier. In order for the soldier to be protected but also move, it was designed and perfected and fitted in a perfect way so that the soldier could move, could do what he needed to do, could move his arms, could move his weapons, could still defend himself, could still get his arms high enough to defend himself. And as weapons advanced, and they did, through the ages, so did armor technology. And so it started out as probably just leather, a lot of scholars believe, and then they started sewing wood to different parts of the leather. So it was getting heavier, but it was still protecting. And then metal started to become more and more popular. And in this day and age, we're at the point now where Saul has a bronze helmet. It would have been heavy, and it would have been hot. I thought that was interesting. I never thought about that. But that's what the scholars were talking about this week, that helmets generated a lot of heat. So David put something on his head, to look like someone else. He put something on his body that was not designed for him. And he's going to go and fight a battle that God has asked him to fight, but he's going to do it with someone else's preparation. I think there are times in our lives where we may be asked to fight battles. Do you know that God picked you for that battle for a reason? He picked you. Whatever it might be. Whether it's to go back into a school system right now that's scary as anything, right? There's a few of you who know exactly what that's like. Or to go through a devastating family trial that you had no anticipation of. In fact, if we had to guess anybody in the church, 
I mean, I definitely would have been first. It wouldn't have been, would been Jen. And yet God put her through things that she had to learn to endure and to persevere through. But if it ever happens again to someone here or outside of here, we know who to point them to, don't we? We know what it's like. We have people here who have been through it. But my method and my plan and my procedure is not going to work for Jen or for Jean or for any of you. No, God wants you to operate in your own preparation. I spend time every week preparing sermons. I hope you can tell. I don't just get up and wing it. I guess I could, but you'd all be able to tell that too. Uh, I spend time preparing because it's important. The, the things in life that are most important are things that you hopefully take time to prepare for. That's why they say it's important to do things like prepare for your funeral early. Prepare your will. Prepare for your marriage. Prepare for uh, any kind of uh, financial need your family might have in the future. These are all things that require extensive preparation. They're important things. You don't usually prepare for things that aren't important. So if you look at your life now and you think about what it is you're wearing, what's the armor, what is it you have on, what is it that you have around you, what are you preparing for? What is God preparing you for? You, you wake up in the morning and you go to work, and there are people there who need Jesus. Is it possible that he's preparing you to talk to them since you are going through the exact same thing they are going through right now? You're getting up, you're going to work, you're trying to live your life in the midst of a pandemic, you're doing all these other fun things, right? God wants to use you now. He wants to use me now, and he wants to use us in a place where he has prepared us to be used. When I got here, I think God had prepared me to come in. Everybody was so tired. Can you imagine, as driven as I am, can you imagine, just be honest, if I come in, I'm specifically talking to like the four board members who are here, all five, because she lives here too. If I come in and I've just been a slave driver, would that have worked good? Probably not. I don't think anybody would have stayed. No, 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 we've done this before. We are tired. We are worn out. We have had enough. But God had prepared me. He'd given me staff who were burned out. He'd given me people who were tired. I was burned out. So then when I came in and saw it, I said, oh, we're not doing anything. I'm just going to wait. Wait and let people deal. Because I had been prepared in my own fire, in my own circumstance. David looks at Saul and he says to him, I, I don't know any of these things. I don't know your armor. I don't know your sword. None of it's for me. And I think there might be people here today who need to say, it's not for me. The way my parents did it, it's not for me. The way my friends did it, it's not for me. Can you imagine what your life would look like if you shed armor that you're carrying right now that you're not supposed to have on? If you got rid of that stuff that you thought was going to protect you, but instead is hindering your movement and your growth and stopping you from being able to fight the battles God wants you to fight to begin with? All the baggage that we carry into battle with us all the time. Oh, mom said I was never going to be good enough, so we just kind of wear that like a cloak. And then what happens? We convince ourselves we're never going to be good enough. When Jesus says, I have given you purpose and hope and a place, and I know the plans I have for you. Wouldn't you rather listen to that voice? And I would. David strips his armor off. He says, I can't. I, I haven't tested these. Uh, they're not going to work for me. He takes his staff in his hand and he chose for himself five smooth stones from a brook. He puts them in his shepherd's bag in a pouch and he takes his sling and he draws near to Goliath. Turn with me to Romans chapter 13. We're going to end there. Because in Romans... What we find is Paul talking about armor as well. But he's talking about a different kind of armor. Romans chapter 13, starting in verse 11. And do this, knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. Do you know the first step in preparation is to awaken? It is to wake up. I was going to show you this video clip where we're having all kinds of fun tech issues. It looks like Sandy might fix them, though, because she's amazing and she's a wizard. Um, not the kind of we're supposed to stone from the Old Testament, though, so don't be angry. 
but she's very good at what she does. Um, there's this idea, this concept, that the reason we're not prepared is because we're sleeping. Jesus talks about it. He talks about the, the women with the oil and how they fall asleep. Uh, Paul is now talking about it. If David slept through the battle like the other men had for 40 days, do you think the giant ever would have fallen? Of course not. He would have just been sleeping. Paul says, wake up. Wake up. In Ephesians, there's this great verse. It says, wake up, and the Lord will give you light. He will give you light. And do this knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore, therefore, anytime there's a therefore, you have to ask, why is this there? Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light. I haven't been able to shake this recurring thought that's come to me all week long about this little tiny statement, the armor of light. It's the only place in the entire Bible that says it. That word light in Greek is photos. You can imagine what we get in our language from that word. But it means light. It just means light. Other translations translated as good deeds, good works. Do things that are good. Why? Because they shine in the face of darkness. Right now, we are in a society, as Stephanie said, that is crumbling around us. It's really exciting to watch, isn't it? If you do any kind of uh, history research and you read about Rome and you read about what they went through, we're like in that start to lead up to the subsidies and the just keep giving away and giving away and eventually the mountain topples. It's really scary, actually. Or it can be. But what does Paul say? Hey, listen, Romans. Hey, you Roman citizens, who he's writing to, put on the armor of light. What does that mean? It means everywhere you go, you shine brightly. And why? Because of Christ in you. Not because you figured it out. Not because you have everything together. Not because your life is perfect. It's because Jesus is in you and he shines through you. That is an incredible, incredible thing. It takes a lot of pressure off of us, doesn't it? See, Jesus knows you intimately. If he knows you intimately, he knows exactly what size armor you are. He's not going to give you the wrong size. And he's not going to give you the wrong plans. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. What is he saying to them? You are to be an example. You should have something on that makes you an example. That when people see you, they go, there is something very different about her. There is something very different about him. He has been touched. He's wearing something. In fact, something is all around them and protecting them. And it's not them. It's beautiful and it shines. And it makes things so much different than what my life feels like. There's nothing worth saying to me than when I see people understand and embrace the truth of Jesus. Because their whole life Changes And it's like walking from a dark room into something that's like, you have to blink, you got to clear your eyes, and you go, wow, this has been here the whole time, and I didn't know about it. But God loved me, and he cared about me, and he knew me, and he saw me, and he never forgot me. I was clothed in the armor of God. So, we're intentionally going to stop a few minutes early, because... We want to give people time to reflect and respond today. And while we do that, I want you to ask yourself this question. Am I prepared? Am I prepared? I'm not talking about doomsday preppers. I'm not talking about putting a bunker in your backyard, guys. Or buying a lot of guns or ammo or anything else. Am I prepared to do what God is asking me to do? And why have I gone through what I've gone through up to this point in my life? Because there's a lot of us with a lot of unanswered questions we would love to direct right toward God, isn't there? Wouldn't we love people to say, why did you make me lose my parents? Why did you make me lose my husband? Why did you make me go through this craziness? Why, God? You love, I love you. You love me. You have a plan for my life. Why am I going through this? And there's no greater expression of that love than when he starts to show you 
everything he wove together so that you could be used for his glory. Let's take some time to sit and listen and pray. If you want to come to the altar, you can. If you want to save your seat, you can. But we're just going to spend some time in the Lord right now.